Hi, wonderful AP Human Geography students. This is Dr. Gillespie, and I am going to talk to you a little more about cities and urban land use patterns in cities. This is Chapter 11, Fellman, and um, I want to remind you that you can pause this YouTube lecture at any time and copy notes down, um, make um, some kind of annotation about some of the um, pictures I'm going to show you, the graphs, the, the uh, map models. So don't hesitate. You can stop and start the video whenever you want to. But basically, land use um, refers to what takes up the physical space of a town or city. Now, the main urban land uses are, there's about five of them. Residential, you always have people living in a place or a city. Um, industrial, any kind of major industry that would have caused people to come to the uh, particular location and live uh, for jobs. You have commercial or trade types of land uses. You also have um, administrative functions. How many uh, of you live in a capital city of your state or uh, maybe the county seat if you live in a county or um, you know, it's just a place where the government offices reside. Infrastructure, including transportation, is usually a land use of a city. You usually have um, highways and bridges and light rail, uh, maybe um, railroads. You have transportation on the river or on the, uh, if you're in a seaport, uh, the ocean transportation. So there are lots of functions the last one is open space, and this can be planned open space like a park or recreational area, or it could be derelict space, a vacant lot in a rundown part of, of the city. That is also a land use. Um, we, use we like to show urban models as a way to uh, show the variations in land use. And these geographic models can uh, oftentimes be explained using a theory that should be near and dear to your heart from Von Thunen and his uh, agricultural model, and that is the bid rent theory. And bid rent theory is uh, land or property or rental unit costs increase the closer one gets to the city's central business district. Now, a city will always have a central business district, or CBD, where most of the commerce and trade takes place. A city will also include an industrial district, where most of the manufacturing takes place. And a city will have one or more outlying residential areas. Um, this is a picture, a photograph of Pittsburgh, the nearest city to where I live. And you can see the skyscrapers in the Central Business District. Um, usually the skyscrapers are sponsored by a major corporation or a business centered in the city. Uh, in this case, uh, one is sponsored by PPG, another by the, uh, the major healthcare system in, in town. And I wanted to draw your attention to the two rivers here. We have Coming down from the north of, of Pennsylvania, we have the Allegheny River. And coming up from West Virginia uh, to Pittsburgh, we have the Monongahela River. And together, when two rivers converge, we call it the confluence of the rivers. And at the confluence, or point, uh, is it, they form the Ohio River, which flows north until it turns and flows south and into the Mississippi River. So here is a little monument to um, uh, actually Fort Pitt at this is called Point State Park, an urban land use. And it's a very popular place, very beautiful little area of, of land use that is just uh, basically open space, planned open space. Um, so anyway, that is the central business district or town center or downtown area. And many times the CBD is a historic center of the city. Uh, most cities, well, let's talk about rent. 
Uh, rent in bid rent does not refer to how much your apartment rent is every month. It really refers to, um, well, but it can reflect directly to that because higher apartment rental costs can be an indicator of an area's desirability or density. People who live in the CBD may have more readily available social and economic opportunities than those living in the outskirts areas. Businesses located in the CBD can generate greater profits thanks to the dense population. So the high, high desirability of both residential apartments and retail spaces in the CBD drives prices up. And this is the heart of the bid rent theory. The closer the business is to the central business district, the more that business will have to pay to rent or purchase that piece of property. Now, human geography loves models because models show a simplified version of reality. All models, all models are based on a theory, and the theory is not gospel truth. A theory is an idea or a belief that certain things happen because of certain other things. That's what a theory is. Um, theories are simplified, simplified abstract pictures of why land use differs in cities and why cities are located in certain places and why different groups of people are found in different places within the city. All models are based on a set of assumptions or conditions that are assumed to be present in order for the model to apply. The first model that we want to look at is the Burgess Concentric Zone Model. It was developed by Ernest Burgess in 1925. And we call it the Concentric Ring Model, but it's important to know the name of the person or persons who originated this, these models that we're going to study. You see this series of concentric rings coming out from the center. They correspond to different types of land use. Now in the very middle of the city, we see the central business district, the blue circle. And coming out, and that's where the skyscrapers and businesses are located. Then the next ring is a transition zone, and it's sort of an inner city area where there are light manufacturing um, facilities where most people work. Then going outward, a series of residential zones. The green is the lower class, and when we say class, we mean uh, economic class, not social class. Uh, the lower class um, residential is the green, and it's in the old city area the old inner city areas. Then the medium class residential, where these people have mo mo very modest homes, small homes, but not apartments so much. And the yellow suburbs, the high class residential areas. And so we can see the residential areas become wealthier towards the edge of the city. Now, Burgess model was based entirely on Chicago. The model is useful for a number of reasons. First of all, it simplifies greatly um, the reality that can apply to many cities in this country particularly. It doesn't explain why the zones are where they are, but it is the basis for theories that do. And the bid rent theory is the main theory it kind of explains, and we've talked about that. Um, a few other things that we could say um, in, about the Burgess model are that the CBD is in the center of, of the uh, model or the city because it's the easiest to get to. This will encourage a business to locate there because from every area outside the city, it's an equal distance to get into the central business district and they can access the most customers. The lower class residential area, or the zone of working men homes, is near the factory or transition zone. Because 
it's an undesirable area to live. It's usually polluted and congested, but also because these people uh, typically work, walk to work or use public transportation, such as a bus or a subway to get to their place of business, their factory. People on low incomes cannot afford low, uh, large houses, so these areas become very densely populated with lots of little homes, little apartments, and so forth. Now, as you get outside the outer rings of the city, you see the population density is much, much lower because the house sizes are larger. And the further out you go, the larger the piece of land that the house is on, usually. Now, the high-class residential is around the outskirts in the Burgess model because these people can afford their own cars or uh, transportation to get into the city. And uh, they can get in there quickly and easily and conveniently that way. But the Burgess model is, is criticized um, for many reasons. One reason is because it is too specific to cities in North America. It doesn't fit most uh, historic cities or recent uh, growth cities. It just doesn't work for them. The model is also about 100 years old, okay? And it does not fit the modern age. It is a product of time, of its own time, in terms of the wording used on the model and in terms of the way the model is organized. And there are many assumptions in the model that, that mean it doesn't fit other cities very well. So the next model we want to look at is uh, one that sort of developed Burgess's uh, concentric zone model further. But this time, we're going to call it the Hoyt sector model. So instead of round concentric rings, we have pie-shaped or sort of little cubic zones. In 1939, Homer, Homer Hoyt published a book in which he developed Burgess's ideas after studying 140 cities in the United States. He, he recognized they were more complex than just rings of land use, and he suggested industrial land use is linked to transportation routes. He also suggested the location of transportation and industry within the city affects the location of residential districts, and this results in sectors of the city with different land uses. Now, Hoyt's model follows on from Burgess's model in that the CBD remains in the center of the city. Okay, see the little red CBD? It's in the center. It's the easiest place to access, so it has the most potential uh, customers for commercial businesses. And the sectors are clearly visible in rings that come out from the center. But there are some important differences in the Hoyt sector model from the Burgess. Now look at the two dark blue sectors. These are the manufacturing zone areas here. They are found along transportation routes, especially railways. But also they are found along highways and rivers or canals that link the city center to other cities. The green sectors are the low-class residential land, and it's found nearby and is a poor living environment due to industry. This is the area of pollution and noise and so forth. The high-class residential or brown sector is the furthest away. Now, the high-class residential may also follow transportation routes, especially your highways, as wealthier people have private cars, which they use to get to their jobs in the CBD. The middle-class residential sector is the largest zone and is farther from industry with easy access to transportation routes. <clears throat> now, we want to look at the third model, the Harris and Almonds 
multiple nuclei model. And in 1945, Chauncey, Harris, and Edward Ullman continued the work of Burgess and Hoyt by publishing a new model of the city. This model recognizes that as cities grow, they swallow up the smaller settlements around the edges. Meanwhile, as the city becomes larger, travel between the outskirts and CBD becomes impractical and smaller centers grow throughout the city. This model is more flexible than the first two. It doesn't have a specific location for each zone. Instead, the zones are recognized as existing nearby to one another, but they can be in different places depending on the city. This model also accounts for the development of the car and the CBD is no longer necessarily the easiest place to get to. Like the other models of the Chicago School, which is the first two, the multiple nuclei model does not recognize several key feature, features of cities that could affect how the model applies to reality. This model um, ignores that the fact that high-rise buildings can affect population density. They just don't allow for that. They, this model also has a weakness that if each zone is the same or homogeneous. There's no variation within each zone. It's all considered to be the same, okay, homogeneous. Government policies are not considered either. Urban planning. Um, planning laws, housing regulations are not considered, and the model is hard to apply to non-Western cities, we'll say Asian or Latin American or European cities. Even so, it's the balance between the flexibility of this model and its simplicity that makes it still useful today. Although the Ullman and Harris multiple nuclei model identifies more than one center in the city, it still has a core central business district. So this is the common view of a monocentric city. But most recent scholars um, in the last few decades have argued this is not the way modern cities develop. The Los Angeles School of Urbanism was a group of academics based in Southern California in the 1980s to the 2000s. They formed the idea that large modern cities do not grow around a central business district, but in fact, they grow haphazardly in a sprawling fashion with multiples commercial, industrial, and residential areas that are just spread outward with no real pattern to it. This means that rather than having a main CBD, this is the yellow core here, without having just a main CBD, there will be many city centers. And instead of having a similar mix of land use in these centers, they might have different functions. The purple area is wholesale. See the purple area is wholesale and um, light manufacturing. The peach sections are the lower class residential. The brownish kind of khaki color is middle class residential. And the bright green zone is your high class residential. The high class residential zone occurred away from the mainstream development. As suburbs grow, shopping centers like this brown structure are needed near most homes. And this model argues that the core of the city is in a state of decline, while the periphery of the city is expanding. And this idea relates closely to the issue of urban sprawl. Now, as unless you, um, you could probably guess 
Los Angeles is the city that this model was based on. The land use in Los Angeles has very little clear structure to it. Therefore, it's difficult, if not impossible, to model it in the way the Chicago School modeled cities earlier in the 20th century. For this reason, there is no standard model in the Los Angeles School, which is a key difference to the Chicago School. So in practice, all three models give us insights into the historical and the current development of cities. None, not, there is not one model that is so general that it can apply to all cities everywhere. But equally, they are not so specific that they only apply to the city which gave them their name. This is the geographer's constant issue with models. Either they're too general to be of use when studying a particular settlement, or they're too specific to be applied to more than one city. A middle ground between these two is the aim, so perhaps you will be the geographer, the urban geographer someday, who finds that middle ground and develops that model of land use in an urban area that is general enough to apply to more than one particular uh, city. Um, a major criticism of all the models we've talked about is that they apply to cities in the United States and often North America and even Europe in general. But there are cities in um, Latin America and in Africa and in Europe even that have very different patterns of land use. Latin America, excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. I'm losing my voice. Thank you. Latin America is the portion of North, Central, and South America that lies south of the United States, from Mexico to Chile and Argentina. Cities in Latin America have, ex have um, often experienced rapid industrialization and population growth and this has occurred, uh, I want to say, around 1950 on. So basically, since I was born, um, I was born in 51, uh, we have seen these cities it's exploding in population and industrialization. The core of many of these cities is uh, of a colonial era, about 1500 to uh, 1939. By 1939, most of these countries had uh, broken free from their colonial masters and were independent countries. And uh, so this colonial era center has recently been redeveloped and surrounded by much newer urban development. We often see the model of a Latin American city applied to uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, now, this is the model of the Latin American city that you're going to see in every book everywhere. This is updated to 1996 from the original 1980 version, um, published by Ernest Griffin and Larry Ford. So the Latin American city model was developed by Griffin and Ford, and some of the common features um, simplified in the model are that the um, central Business District is the commercial heart of the city, and you will see the Central Business District is this yellow, as well as the market area, the green area, uh, right next to it. And every Latin American city has an open-air market uh, with livestock and fresh produce, etc., often um, that sort of thing in the center, right next to the CBD. The most historic part of the city will surround the CBD with a mixture of old colonial buildings along with more modern high-rise development. And this is the brown zone called the zone of maturity. There's also a commercial spine that uh, comes along the uh, major roads, which extends the CBD outwards from the center towards the edge of the city retail parks. 
and you can see that marked as uh, mall. Here, this is the commercial spine and the mall area right here in the pale yellow in the diagram. The elite housing zone is lilac. It is the highest class residential area and it lives, uh, these people live near the commercial pale yellow districts. The reason for this, uh, why you ask, well, why do uh, people with a lot of money and high paying jobs live so close to the CBD in the commercial district? There's a couple of reasons, but one very practical reason is how long it's going to take due to traffic congestion to get from your home to your uh, place of employment. Wealthy people avoid traveling long distances between their homes and, and work by living in, uh, in very nice dwelling uh, apartments, complexes, and uh, having a luxurious apartment close to the road to work. And also, uh, people from Latin America um, historically originated uh, in Spain and Portugal where living in the center of the city or close to it was necessary uh, because of their uh, high ranking in government or their, their wealth. Um, and urban living was for the high class wealthier families. They may have uh, plantations or haciendas elsewhere, uh, but they don't live there. And that they brought that tradition over to Latin America. Um, and so it's, it's city living is preferred by them. The Periferico or yellow ring is a ring road that helps the um, traffic move around the edge of the city. So this uh, sort of perimeter type road that goes around is a periphery. Um, the periphery is a periphery or edge district and it is the home of the poorest people. These people uh, generally are newcomers to the city. It's a zone of uh, squatter settlements uh, where they do not have um, space in the middle of the city and they're too poor to rent a place. So these zones of disamenity, yellow zones uh, coming out of the market district are also squatter settlements but they gradually improve with time into permanent residential areas. Um, the zone of in situ accretion is a transitional zone for Latin American cities. It's between the zone of maturity or old colonial brown sector and the zone of peripheral squatter settlements. The homes are of modest quality. They vary widely in size and type and quality of materials. They look like this area is in a constant state of ongoing construction. As a family starts out, they may have the most rudimentary building materials, but as they continue to work and um, hopefully improve their economic status, they start to uh, put windows, glass in the windows, or they may have screens in the windows, or they may have solid doors on the front of the structure, uh, that sort of thing. So you, you constantly see improvements in this um, peripheral squatter um, zone of in situ accretion. Now let's talk about Southeast Asia. You know, Southeast Asia has also a model. Um, Southeast Asian cities generally have a very well-developed colonial center. Although it has often been redeveloped out of all recognition, and you won't be able to see that colonial center. Uh, most major cities in Southeast Asia have their port cities. So they are originally located on the coast for trade, and then they expand in all directions from the coastline. So there, there are no rings um, from the center uh, happening, but more it's a wedge or a semi-circular shape coming out from the, um, the port zone. So here is, um, this is McGee's model of land use areas in a large 
Southeast Asian city. And the red here is on the coast. This is the port zone. And then you see the wedges coming out from the port zone, government functions, the western commercial, alien commercial zones for trade, and the middle class and high class residential zones are sort of all mixed together in the first three outer rings from the port. Terry McGee developed this very influential model of a Southeast Asian city um, and put it in a book published in 1967. It's been updated to reflect the fast growth of population and expansion of the urban area since then. Especially important is the location of the brown or new industrial zones, which are not on the coast, but they're inland, where there is lots of cheap land. Note how similar this model is to Hoyt's sector model, but it's been adapted to suit the Asian experience. The, um, the next to the last model we're going to discuss is the Sub-Saharan African city. And let's talk about what do I mean by Sub-Saharan? Sub-Saharan Africa is um, all of the African continent except the northern tier of countries, which are North, uh, uh, North Africa. They're generally um, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, um, Tunisia, those are considered North Africa based on the Mediterranean Ocean there. Uh, anything south of that, or maybe we'll say south of the Sahara Desert, is considered Sub-Saharan under the C Saharan Desert, Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? Um, so Harm de Blay was a geographer who, among many other interests, studied the urban development of cities in Sub-Saharan Africa. And he recognized that there was frequently an old CBD, this zone right here, an old CBD, uh, the purple zone with colonial buildings, and a little bit of redevelopment. The traditional CBD is shown in gold, okay? So we have a colonial, CBD and a traditional one. But he said cities often have an open air market zone where informal economic activity takes place, where bartering takes place, where um, open air uh, trading and um, uh, selling of produce and so forth goes on. Residential areas are the yellow areas and the, re the only way they are distinguished from one another is by the, um, not just by the household wealth, but by ethnicity. And this is an important distinction from the other city models we have studied. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it is the ethnic group that is located in these different um, settlements and areas. Um, we find that um, the new migrants usually set up squatter settlements on the edges of the city, so they are the poorest of the residents, but they're also set up by ethnic group. Now, part of the reason is because some African countries were created from arbitrary colonial borders rather than from tribal or national groupings. So ethnically similar people group together when they migrate to the city. If you look at a modern map of Africa and observe the large number of straight line or geometric borders, you will see that many of these borders reflect agreements made by European powers in the Berlin Conference that took place in 1884 and 1885. It separated territories between European countries such as France and Great Britain, Portugal, Belgium, and Spain for the purposes of colonial expansion. When countries achieved their independence, they kept the borders. The final 
model we're going to look at is a really kind of an interesting one that's come up very lately. This is very recent. This is the modern Chinese city model. The modern Chinese city has developed according to the planning principles of the Chinese communist government, which maintains strict control over internal migrations within China and strict controls on construction. So since the late 1980s, the Chinese government has presided over the largest mass migration in history with over 80 million people permanently migrating from the rural areas in the center of China in the western part to urban cities in the south and east. And maybe over 230 million moved for seasonal work while returning home occasionally because their children were still living at home. The result has been a planned expansion of both population and urban footprint of many Chinese cities. Some huge cities have resulted, including the mega cities of Shanghai, Beijing, and Chongqing. Now the city of Shenzhen is the Maslow model for smart cities. Shenzhen is a special economic zone in uh, the People's Republic of China, otherwise known as just China now, or communist China, an area in which the business trade and trade laws differ from the rest of China. A special economic zone uh, is a specific area that is allowed to function differently by the communist government because it is meant to bring in more trade, foreign investment and trade, and create more jobs and to encourage businesses to set up in this zone, financial policies only uh, they can have, uh, such as reduced tariffs or tariff-free goods, uh, lowered customs, maybe no labor laws or labor quotas, to create goods for trade at a lower price to help make the country globally competitive. In some countries, the zones are thought to be little more than forced labor camps, where workers have no say in their working conditions or lives. Additionally, companies may be offered tax holidays, where upon establishing themselves in a zone, they're granted a, a time of lower taxation. Walking on the streets of Shenzhen, few remnants of the past uh, of, as, a, as a fishing village remains. Instead, the city is a concrete jungle of modern high-rise buildings 40 years after it was named as China's first special economic zone. Shenzhen's development has been accompanied by an equally staggering rise as a leading smart city in China, and Shenzhen is ahead of other cities, surpassing uh, the likes of Beijing and Shanghai in innovation and technical capabilities. Shenzhen is a tech hub and this has been planned. Every smart city goes through four steps of transformation according to Huawei. Uh, Huawei is a huge um, communication uh, network, a, a tech company in China. Um, but Huawei's chairman Guoping says that every smart city goes through four steps of transformation. And he calls this the Maslow's model for smart city development. He thinks this can function as a framework for cities to implement smart solutions globally. Now, um, Guo was speaking at the Shenzhen Smart City Forum, and he talked about these four layers in Maslow's hierarchy of needs for smart cities. The original model states that people are motivated to achieve certain needs and take some precedence, and some of these needs take precedence over others. So he said to apply Maslow's hierarchy of needs to the smart city, he said a smart city requires certain basic requirements or foundations. The first layer, 
they have to have a um, an infrastructure, a modern ICT, or which is information and communications technology infrastructure for connectivity. And this is this ICT gives us modern computing, information and communications technology. He said the development of 5G and artificial intelligence, which we hear about all the time, AI, are as significant as a discovery and use of electricity more than a few hundred years ago. And having this strong digital infrastructure is essential as a base on which everything else is built. The second step is building up both the physical and digital safety through the use of technology. With a high-speed network and advancements in artificial intelligence, there are huge opportunities to ramp up security with the likes of smart surveillance. And um, so it is imperative that there is safety and stability or the second layer for businesses to feel confident and uh, invest. The use of IoT or Internet of Things consists of all the web enabled devices that gather and send and act on information they get from their embedded sensors and their processors and their communication hardware. So the, this Internet of Things or this I OT is um, basically all the things that we call smart technology from our smartwatch to our smart TV to our smart thermostats to our robot vacuums, the fitness trackers, the ring doorbells. Um, you could name so many things, uh, smart refrigerators that are in our homes right now. These smart devices are context-aware devices capable of performing autonomous computing and connecting to other devices for data exchange. So a smart device has three main features. Number one is content awareness. My smart watch can tell me my blood pressure. It can tell me way more than just a watch would, a time of day. It can tell me my blood pressure, my oxygen content of my blood, uh, how many steps I'm taking in a day. Um, it can tell me all of these things, which means it's, a, it's content aware. Um, it also must have a, a autonomous computing so it can function on its own and connectivity. So I know that somewhere in Shenzhen, the content uh, my watch is gathering from my body is being stored and accessed and used probably for research in China. Um, everyone's smart appliances is taking information and it's being accumulated somewhere else for reasons, uh, hopefully good reasons, but one never knows. Even though um, these devices are small, they are powerful enough to process data without having even to report back to the cloud. So these small smart, smart devices are very, very powerful. Well, Shenzhen has seen tangible results in the fast growing city. All the new information and therefore the internet accessible nature of the devices raises privacy and security concerns. Since the implementation of smart closed uh, circuit televisions and uh, the in informa inf internet of things, IOT, in policing, the overall crime rate in um, one of the worst districts in Shenzhen for crime, one of the den most densely populated, has decreased uh, almost 30 percent, almost a third decrease in crime just because they have this monitoring, this surveillance, smart surveillance going on. Um, 
Shenzhen is also um, on track to be the first city in China to roll out a citywide 5G network. And it's already using the, the latest technology in areas like public security, telemedicine, and transport. So, um, and actually when I purchased this watch for almost $50, it didn't come from China. It didn't say made in China. It said made in Shenzhen. So I know this is the latest um, innovation and I know that my information is being collected but I really don't care. I figure everything I have and do is already recorded somewhere by someone. So I am not going to mind that. It's more important that I collect this information from my own doctor. And he's very happy I do. The third layer is the private, the screen layer is the private public cooperation in the digitalization process. Um, government support is needed for sectors to develop in this Maslow model and for private companies to contribute to public service delivery. So government has to be involved and um, these can be in the form of having a digital transformation roadmap, open data for companies to work with, or simply creating an ecosystem for different players to come together. So there must be a private public cooperation. Whenever we say public, we're referring to government uh, and private being private enterprise, companies, private institutions, that sort of thing. So that's private versus public, which is more government uh, oriented. Now, Huawei is an example of how Shenzhen worked with private companies for public needs. The Chinese tech giant Huawei worked with local authorities for a smart traffic brain project to reduce accidents and manage traffic flows. The city government is also using WeChat, the leading messaging platform in China, for public transactions. So people would say, well, that's good. It's good that the government is providing us safety through monitoring and that sort of thing. Um, but it's also not good in that our private uh, comings and goings and interactions are also being tracked and monitored. Um, so, but anyway, the end goal of the transformation is to give cities a digital brain, said Guo. This means a citywide system that integrates data across all government agencies and services and all businesses and to create social value. Um, these data can be used then for industry management to identify which sectors to focus on and can be used to allocate resources according to society needs. And if you understand the communist model of government, it is about the government directs the flow of resources within the country. Um, Hence, the largest migration of people. The people didn't decide to move to the cities from the rural regions. They were told to. So there is a giving up of freedom and flexibility and independence in a communist country for the greater good of the whole. And so uh, resources are allocated uh, where the government wants those resources to go. So as the leading smart city in China, Shenzhen has managed to achieve this um, digital brain with a central command center, which helps integrate and coordinate more than 2,000 data sources from across agencies. And this is done in real time, okay? This includes some 4 billion items of data and an exchange volume that can go up to 80 million pieces of data exchanged every day. Today, more than half of the world lives in urban areas. By 2050, the number is expected to increase to some two-thirds of the world's population, according to the United Nations. While this may lead to some um, overcrowding of cities, 
and excessive use of resources, there is also an opportunity for cities of the world to grow and learn together. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry this has been almost an hour of unmitigated lecture on urban models, but as I said before, you can pause the video at any point, uh, come back tomorrow, come back the next day, um, take some notes, whatever, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hoarse, I've just gotten over terrible cold, so I probably um, look like 10 miles of rough road. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for your listening, and uh, have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week. Bye.